Hi, I'm Eric Siegel with Eric'sTrains.com, and welcome to episode 40 of my video train blog series. Okay, it's mid-January 2014. I hope everybody had a Merry Christmas and is having a good start to 2014. I've got a lot of stuff to show you today, so let's go ahead and get things started with a progress report on the layout. All right, so the first thing everyone wants to know about is the status of the big steel trestle here in the main room. In the last episode, I talked about getting the third and final section built. Well, that is currently underway. I sent the temporary track over to Stainless Unlimited, and he is in the process of building me the third and final section. Hopefully, it'll be done in a few weeks, maybe a month or so, and then when I have it back, I will paint it and weather it and add the deck and the track up on top, and then we will have a completed trestle up here on the top level. That's going to be really exciting when that happens. So stay tuned for that, probably in the next month or so, hopefully February sometime, that'll happen. Now while we're over here, I've also added some new trees. That little growth of trees on the hill is brand new. And I've also done some work on the creek here. If you recall, there used to be a big hole in the layout right here, but I had to fill it in to accommodate the second section of the trestle. And then I put a hidden pop-up panel right there. So I had to change the mirrors that were on the ends of the creek to culverts. So I've added a culvert on this side. If you look over on this side, the, this still has a mirror and I have to replace that with a culvert as well. And then once I've replaced them with culverts, I will finally be able to start putting some water in the creek, which will be nice. Over here on the north end of the main room, I've done some work back there. I've got some ground cover on the hillside. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to be doing a lot of work on this end of the layout because, among other things, I'm starting to do some road work on the layout. I'll talk more about it in a couple minutes when I go to the Colorado room because I've started building some roads in there. But just know that over the next few weeks, these roads are going to start looking much better and the scenery in general over here is going to look more complete. And that includes this water tower. This is a Lionel water tower that was originally painted for New Jersey Transit and I've repainted it sort of a sky blue to match a lot of the water towers around my neck of the woods. And I'm going to be building a chain link fence around the water tower and the eventual pump house. And so to that end, I've started building a chain link fence kit that I bought from Dennis Brennan. So let's go back to the workbench and I'll show you the chain link fence that's in progress. Okay, so here we have a couple of chain link fence sections that I'm working on. This section here is complete except for the final paint job. Right now it's sort of a primer gray, but in the end it'll be more of a dark gray silver color. And then there's another section right here that I'm still working on. This was actually complete last night, but I took off these two sections of chain link material because I wasn't happy with the way it was looking. So I'm going to redo these two sections tonight. But other than that, it's pretty much ready to go. Now, the way these work is that the frames are made out of metal. There are metal pieces that come with the kit that you cut to the right size and then you solder them with a soldering iron to make the frame. And then the chain link material is this webbing material that also comes with the kit and you stretch it over the frame and then glue it into place and you've got yourself a nice realistic looking chain link fence. And the reason it's realistic looking is because it's based on real chain link fences. It has a lot of the same parts so therefore it looks like a real chain link fence. I'm really happy with the results and I will certainly be buying a lot more of these kits because I'm planning on having chain link fences all over my layout. Now, when you're making the chain link fence sections, you use this template that comes with the kit. There are a series of bolts that can be rearranged for a number of different purposes depending on what section of fence you're making. Whether you're making an open section like this or a section at the end that has the support bar or a gate. You can also make gates. So what you're seeing here are two sides of the fence that's going to go around the water tower. There's going to be a third side, which I haven't made yet. And then the fourth side will be a couple of gates. And I'll use this template to make those frames for the third section here, as well as the gates. Here is the box that the kit comes in. This is the ultra realistic chain link fence kit from Brennan's Model Railroading. It costs about $33 and it gives you enough material to make 384 scale feet of fence or about eight feet of fencing. Now that assumes that you're doing a great job and using all of the material efficiently. My first time out, I've wasted a little bit of material making mistakes and so forth. So out of my first kit, I'll probably get maybe five or six feet, but in the future, 
now that I'm getting better and better as I go along, I'll probably be able to get about eight feet out of every kit. So they're looking really good. And he gives you a picture of a fence that he made so that you can kind of compare your work to his and sort of see what it should look like when it's all finished. So it's always nice to have something like this. Now, a lot of you are probably gonna say, well, Eric, can you make a video showing us how you make these fences? Well, I'm not gonna do that. And the reason is because the instructions that come with the kit are fantastic. You know, a lot, a lot of kits out there do not have good instructions and you're forced to sort of guess on what you have to do. But Dennis takes a lot of time to make really good instructions with his kits. And these instructions are so good that if I was to make a video showing you how I made these fence pieces, it would basically just be me reading you the instructions word for word. So rather than me doing that, if you're interested in building a fence like this, just do yourself a favor and buy the kit. One more thing I want to show you here in the main room is the scratch-built diesel shop that I've been working on. I really haven't made any visible progress on it lately, but I've been doing a lot of planning and design work for this thing because the order in which I assemble it really matters because, for example, I can't put on walls and a roof without first doing the interior details, and I can't do the interior details without doing the framework and the wiring for the lighting and so forth. So there's a specific sequence that I need to assemble this thing in, and that's what I've been working on. But I'm expecting to make some visible progress on this thing over the next month or two. The last place on the layout I want to show you today is the Colorado room. I've done some work here as well. I've added about 20 or 30 trees since you last saw this room. Although it may not look like it because trees really get swallowed up on a layout. You can add 20 or 30 trees and it barely makes a dent. But I have added quite a few trees and it's looking pretty good, especially back there. There's a lot more trees there. There's a new grove of trees back there. So I'm pretty happy with it. I got a whole lot more trees to add, but it's getting there. I've also covered up the last of the plywood over here with a base coat of scenery. Now I'll be adding a dirt road and so forth later on, but I just wanted to get a base coat down just to cover up the plywood. And of course, I will likely be replacing that structure with something a little bit more appropriate in the future. Something else I'm going to be doing as well is repainting these tunnel portals and stone walls. I don't like that color because it's the same color that the rest of the layout has. So I want to get a new color that's more appropriate to this scenery. So it'll probably be more of a beige or something like that. But that's just something I'm going to be doing in the near future is just is repainting those just to make them a little more appropriate to this room. Also, over here, I've done some scenery work. I've added some trees and some ballast to the track. Now, the area around the station is not very developed yet, but that's on purpose because I'm going to be doing some specialty work there. Because it's a passenger station, I'm going to be adding a walkway next to the track and so forth. So I'll be doing that soon. I'm also going to be putting some lights in the station, some LED lights. So that'll be a lot of fun. And then finally, over here, this bridge, it may not look like it, but I actually completely disassembled and reassembled the middle section of this bridge. Because when I first built this trestle, the clearance between these two tracks has always been an issue. It's very tight clearance. And I knew that from the beginning, but I needed to have a support tower here. And when I first put the support tower in place, I tested both of these tracks with some big cars and big engines, and it worked fine. But there were a couple specialty cars that I just didn't think to test with, and one of those was the solid rocket motor cars for the MTH solid rocket motor transport set. They were really wide cars, much wider than normal cars, and I found that when they went around this curve, they would just scrape the side of the tower here. And it was really getting on my nerves. And so finally, one night, I came down here and I just started breaking off all of this wood, separating all of the wood to get the tower so that it was by itself. And then I moved the tower over this way, not much, about a quarter, quarter of an inch maybe, maybe an eighth of an inch. And that was just enough to make it so those cars can now get past without rubbing against the tower. But again, it's really tight clearances. I mean, on this track here, if I run a big articulated steam engine, it's got about the equivalent of three inches of clearance. If you were to do scale measurements, it would be about three inches of clearance or about a sixteenth of an inch or something like that. It's really crazy. 
But uh, there it is, completely disassembled and reassembled. And then, of course, I repainted it. And then while I was at it, I started coating it with this um, gloss coat stuff so that the wood has a shiny appearance, sort of like creosote on wood. That's the effect I was going for, and so I've started to do that on all of the wood on this bridge. Now, I do want to talk about roads for just a moment because in the main room, I mentioned that I was starting to do some road work on the layout. So what you're looking at is some of that road work. Now, this is not a finished road. This was a test to see if I was happy with the asphalt material. This asphalt is made from a mixture of Woodland Scenics black cinders and white glue, and then I lay it down and allow it to dry. And I like it. It kind of feels and looks like real asphalt. So this is what I'm going to use. But this is not a finished road because the height difference over here between the ground and the top of the track is too great. And that would mean I would have to have a big old ramp to go over this track. So what I'm going to do is raise the roads on the layout up using a road bed material like this. This is the flex bed material that's made by Hobby Innovations. It's the same stuff that I use for the road bed on my track. And what I'm going to do is take it and lay down a couple strips. This is the same thing, it's just an older version of it that I had. It's just a scrap piece that I had laying around. And it'll be like that, and then I'll put the asphalt on top, and then that'll make it much easier to make the grade crossing over the tracks. So that's what I'm going to use for all of the roads on my layout. And again, this stuff is called Flexbed. It's made by Hobby Innovations. And I use this stuff all over my layout. I'm going to use it for all of the roads. It's underneath all of the tracks on my layout. And I also use it for all of the structure locations on the layout. This is the site of the future Coors Brewery. And I'm laying down big sheets of this Flexbed material to serve as a base before I begin work on the scenery and the structure and so forth. This is the same material as this strip, but they sell it in these big squares that you can buy, and then you can use them for whatever you want. So this is really cool material. You can use it for all sorts of stuff all over your layout. So if you've never tried it before, I would highly recommend it. But that's the stuff I'm going to use for these roads. I'm all out of it right now because I haven't needed any of this stuff in a while. So I placed an order about a week ago, and the lady told me it would be about three weeks before they could cut it and ship it. So probably in about three or four weeks, I should get a new batch of this stuff, and I will start gluing it down and putting asphalt on top and making some roads for the layout. Okay, that does it for layout progress. Now I want to show you some new products that have come in recently, starting with a new camera that I just picked up. Now the story behind this is that originally the plan was that before video blog episode 40, which is what you're watching now, I was going to release a video called Layout Update Number 10. And in that video, I would do a year-end review for 2013, where I would compare the state of the layout in late 2013 with the state of the layout in late 2012, so that you could see the progress that was made over the last year. And typically when I do the big layout update videos, I will put a video camera on the front of the train, and run it around the layout so that you can get a sort of train's eye view of the layout. Well, in the middle of making layout update number 10, the camera that I put on the front of the train broke, and so I had to replace it, and I had to delay the release of layout update number 10, and instead put out this video, episode 40, of the video train blog series. So this is the replacement camera. This is a GoPro Hero 3 Plus. It's a fantastic little camera. It's tiny, but it shoots all sorts of HD video. It takes pictures. It comes with a case that's waterproof, so you could take it underwater. You could take it skydiving. It's basically an action camera, and that's what it's normally used for. But I decided to get it because it's small enough to fit on the front of the train, and yet it's still versatile so that I can use it for other things that I may need it for as well. Now, I do want to take a moment to hopefully clear up some confusion that some of you guys have about the camera that rides on the front of the train. When I talk about that camera, I am not talking about this camera car. Some of you guys may have seen this car before in previous episodes. This is an MTH Husky Stack car that I've outfitted with a little video camera. The camera is mounted up in this top stack, and it looks out of this little hole that I drilled right there, and it draws its power directly from the track. And it's a nice little car for shooting decent video while the train goes around the layout. But this is not the video car that rides on the front of the train for the YouTube videos. I will never use this car for YouTube videos because the video quality is just not very good. 
It's not HD, it's analog, and it's basically a security camera that's in there and a wireless security camera at that. So the video quality is just not very good and so I would never use this for video that I'm gonna put up on YouTube. What I use this for is I have three television screens around the layout and this camera broadcasts to those screens and that way when I have visitors to the layout, they can look up at the screens and see what the train sees as it goes around the layout. So the video camera that rides on the front of the train rides on a different car. It rides on this car. And I don't know if a lot of you guys have seen this before. I don't typically show it because there's really not much to see. This is another MTH Husky Stack car. I've removed the stacks, of course, and I've modified it to hold a small digital video camera. And it's really nothing fancy. What I did is I put some lead weights down in the well portion of the car to make the car heavy. Because if you have a car riding in front of the engine, it needs to be heavy enough to track through switches and so forth without any trouble. And then what I did is I covered it up with styrene plastic and then made a little slot up here to hold the camera. Again, nothing fancy. Now, the previous camera that I was using was an old Canon PowerShot ELF camera that it was just small enough where I could fit it in a slot right up here in the front of the car. And it worked fine. It wasn't HD, but the video quality was pretty good. But again, like I said, that camera broke a few days ago and I had to replace it. So I got the GoPro Hero 3 Plus camera. I modified the front of the car so that now it holds the Hero 3 Plus like that. And that's all there is to it. Okay, so moving on, I've also got some new trains to show you today. I've actually had a lot of new items come in recently, which is not unusual for December and January, because that's when a lot of items tend to ship. And of course, a lot of new trains means that I will be doing a lot of new product review videos in the near future. So to start things off, here we have the new Lionel Milwaukee Road 18-inch aluminum passenger cars. They made six cars, and they were sold in two sets, a set of four and a set of two. I've got all six cars here, and they are absolutely beautiful. They were actually cataloged back in 2011, but it took a couple years for them to come out, and I believe they finally started shipping them late last year in 2013. Now, I'm really happy to finally have these cars in my fleet because I've got two Milwaukee Road engines in my collection that I've been waiting to put these cars behind for a while. The first is the well-known Lionel Milwaukee Road S3 Northern that was actually cataloged at the same time as these cars, and the other is a set of Lionel Milwaukee Road F7s that have the same paint scheme as these cars. So again, I'm really glad to finally have some nice passenger cars to put behind those engines. I've also just finished converting all six of these cars to LED lighting. So they now have nice, soft, yellow, low amperage LED lighting that doesn't flicker nearly as much as the original incandescent bulbs did. And I know a lot of you guys would like me to do a tutorial showing how to convert a passenger car to LED lighting. I am planning to make that video in the future, but I didn't want to make that video with these cars because converting these particular cars to LED lighting wasn't the easiest thing ever and it was sort of an atypical conversion so they weren't a good candidate for a tutorial video. MTH passenger cars on the other hand are the easiest cars to convert to LED lighting so the next time I convert one of my MTH passenger cars to LED lighting I will make a tutorial video out of it and in fact I do have several MTH passenger cars right now that need to be converted so hopefully it won't be too long before that video is out. Now, this set will most likely be the next product review video that I put up on YouTube, so keep an eye out for that, probably sometime in the next few days or so. Up next, I've got a few items from Weaver Models, starting with this Canadian National K5A that I just picked up. It's a beautiful engine, and I actually had Weaver weatherize it at the factory to make it look a little dirty, and I will be doing a review on this in the next few weeks. I've also got this really gorgeous Boston and Maine P4 from Weaver Models. It's got a great whistle sound, and again, I will be doing a review on this pretty soon. And I also picked up a few Seaboard Coastline boxcars from Weaver. Now, I will not be doing a review on these because they're just boxcars, but they are nice, so I did want to show them to you real quick. Back in the Lionel corner, here's a fan favorite that I know a lot of you guys are excited about. This is the new Lionel New York Central water level freight set. It consists of the Mohawk steam engine, 
three freight cars in a caboose. It's a fantastic set. The whistle is outstanding, and I will try really hard to get a review out for this in the next two or three weeks. Also from Lionel, I picked up another of the Norfolk Southern Heritage Series ES44s. In this case, it's the Monongahela. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I already have the Central of Georgia ES44, so I decided to pick up another one. Now, I won't be doing a review on this model because I already did a review on the Central of Georgia ES44. So if you want to see that review, just look it up on my YouTube channel. Here's another Norfolk Southern Heritage ES44, but this one is not made by Lionel. This one is made by MTH, and as you can see, this is the Southern version. This is a great model. They've added some really nice features to these ES44s. Now, the sound effects are typical MTH, which is to say they sound good, but not great. The Lionel ES44s sound better. But I did make a couple modifications to this engine to help the sound effects sound a little bit better. And I'll cover those modifications when I do a review on this model in the near future. Now, for those of you who may be wondering why some of my heritage units would be Lionel and others would be MTH, it's because I like both brands. They each have their pros and cons, and they're each great models. So my thinking is that if I'm going to get a bunch of heritage units, why not have some of them be Lionel and some of them be MTH so that I sort of get the best of both worlds. And while we're on the subject of heritage units, here are three of the new Lionel Norfolk Southern Heritage SD70s. So far, I've picked up the Savannah and Atlanta, the Erie and Virginian units. These are beautiful models. Now, externally, they are almost identical to the SD70s that Lionel has been putting out for many years now. And since I already did a review on one of the Lionel SD70s a few years ago, I haven't been in a big hurry to do a review on one of these. However, they did change the sound set on these new SD70s, and they did not change it for the better, in my opinion. The horn on the older SD70s was one of my favorite horns out of all the engines in my collection. The horn on the old SD70 was one of my favorites, and for some unknown reason, they decided to change the horn on these new SD70s to this really shrill, nasally horn that I am not a big fan of. And I have no idea why they made that change, but they did, and I have been scratching my head ever since. But other than that, these are great engines, and I will try to get a review out as soon as I can. Here's something else that's new from Lionel. Now, I don't typically buy O27 trains because they don't match up with the scale trains that I run on the layout. But I will make exceptions from time to time when there's something that catches my eye. This is the second set of presidential boxcars from Lionel. They put out the first set a couple years ago, and this is the second set, and it consists of Harry S. Truman, Calvin Coolidge, John Adams, and Andrew Johnson. And then, of course, on the side of each car, you've got a little bit of information about each president. Now, these cars are special because they are made in the USA, at least according to Lionel. Now, on the box, it says that they are made in the USA of U.S. and imported parts. So my guess is that what's probably going on is that the plastic part of the car and the painting is being done in the USA, whereas all of the metal parts are brought in from overseas and simply assembled here in the U.S. I'm guessing that because that's the way that Weaver models tends to work. At least I think that's how they work. All of their plastic stuff is made here in the U.S., and then their trucks and so forth are brought in from China. So I'm just guessing that that's what Lionel did as well, but I can't verify that. Now, what's really nice about these cars is the boxes that they come in. They've changed the box from the first set, and they've now got this really cool-looking box that looks like an American flag. And they did a great job on it. Now, I don't know if these boxes are made in the USA or not, but hats off to Lionel for making such cool boxes. Now, of course, I won't be doing a review on these cars because they're just standard Lionel 027 box cars. But I did want to show them to you because they are really cool. Here's something new from MTH. You see, I told you there were a lot of new trains that came in. I wasn't kidding about that. This is a new MTH Union Pacific Veranda Turbine set. It includes the turbine, four boxcars, and a caboose. It's a fantastic set. The engine is a beast. It has four motors in it. So it is an absolute monster. I will be doing a review on this, so look for that sometime in the next few weeks. 
Here's another new item from Lionel. Now, I'm not going to do a review video about this car, but I did want to take a second to show it to you because I think it's pretty cool. This is the new Burlington Northern flat car with stakes. And what makes it special is that it has a real wood deck. And that's just awesome. They did the same thing with the boom car that goes with the TMCC crane. And I think it's just a great touch. And here's another new addition from Lionel. This is the Burlington Mark Twain Zephyr set. It's absolutely amazing. It's all die cast metal. It's got great lighting and detail on the inside. It's just a gorgeous set. Now, this is kind of on the priority for me to review, so I will try to get a review out for this within the next few weeks. As you can see, I've really got my hands full with product reviews. Here's yet another new addition. Man, they just keep on coming. I picked this up in late November. This is the new Lionel Pennsylvania S2 Turbine. This is a magnificent model. I will be doing a review on this, and it's on the front burner in terms of reviews. So I may do a review on this after the Milwaukee Road passenger cars that I showed you earlier. Finally, the last new item that I want to show you today, which is also from Lionel, is the Abraham Lincoln Funeral Train. What you're looking at here actually consists of two different items. The engine and the first car, which contains Lincoln's casket, make up the actual funeral train set. And then the last two cars make up the two-car add-on pack that can be purchased separately. Now, this is a beautiful set, but the engine is conventionally controlled, which means no command control, no TMCC or legacy. And that was a bit of a letdown considering how much this thing cost, but I knew that going in, so that was not a big surprise. Now, when the set arrived, I took some measurements of the inside of the tender, and it looks like there's going to be just enough room to install a small command control board inside the tender, and that will upgrade this thing to command control so that I can run it with my legacy remote. Now, of course, it won't have sound or smoke or anything like that, but I will have basic control over the engine with the legacy remote. I've already ordered the board. It's the mini commander board from the electric railroad company. So as soon as that arrives, I will attempt to upgrade this thing to command control. Another thing I would like to do at some point in the future is to upgrade the passenger cars and add some lighting. There is no lighting in the cars right now. So at some point in the future, I will try to add some pickup rollers to the trucks and add some nice appropriate LED lighting to the passenger cars. Now, I will be doing a full review of this set in the near future, so keep an eye out for that. Okay, that about wraps it up for this episode. Now, the next layout video will be the delayed layout update number 10, which is the annual layout progress report for 2013, which again was delayed because of the broken camera. So that will be the next layout video between this episode and episode 41. And of course, in that video, I will use that new GoPro Hero 3 Plus camera to do the ride around the layout. So that should be a lot of fun. And also keep an eye out for all of the upcoming product review videos. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm Eric Siegel, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>